بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم While the Prophet وسلم, was sitting with the companions, a man came to them. This incident was reported by both Imam al Bukhari on the authority of Umar ibn al Khattab and also by Imam Muslim in authority of Abu Huraira, where the Prophet وسلم, was sitting with his companions and then a man came to him. Nobody recognized him. <coughs> Umar ibn al-Khattab says as we were sitting with the Prophet وسلم, a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and went straight to him picked him out of the whole crowd and went straight to him and sat so close that he locked his knees against the knees of the Prophet وسلم, and then he started asking him questions. None of us recognize this person because he's not from the area. But at the same time, he's puzzling because he didn't look like someone who was traveling, didn't have any signs of somebody who had the hardship of traveling. His clothes are clean, and yet nobody knew who he was. He said, started asking the Prophet وسلم, questions, Oh Muhammad, tell me about Al-Islam. The Prophet وسلم, replies, Al-Islam is to make the testimony of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and establish a salah, give a zakah, fast in Ramadan, and make the pilgrimage to al-hajj he says this man says to the prophet sallallahu you've told the truth he goes tell me about al-iman what is faith what is a creed he says the prophet sallallahu replies by saying is to believe in allah believe in the angels, in the prophets, in the books, in the hereafter, and in the divine decree, good or bad. Replies, as your belief says, you've told the truth, sadaqta. And he asked him again, tell me about al-ihsan. What is the definition of al-ihsan? He says, is for you to believe in Allah as if you are looking literally you're bear witnessing Allah but since you cannot know for a surety that he Allah is looking at every single thing you do and then he walks away asks him about of course about the signs of the hour he gave him the signs and then he disappears in hadith of, uh, reported by Abu Huraira, the Prophet وسلم, told the companions, go look for this man that, that just asked me the questions. They went looking for him, couldn't find him. Then came back to the Prophet وسلم, and he asked him, did you know the person that was asking me all these questions? They said, no, Ya Rasulullah, it's puzzling for us. He says, that was Jibreel alayhi salam, who came to teach you about your own religion. Now, this hadith literally gathers every single thing about the religion of Al-Islam, all of it, all of the three branches of Al-Islam. Al-Islam as a religion has five pillars. La ilaha illallah is the head of everything. And the implications of La ilaha illallah starts with the very practical aspect of La ilaha illallah, which is a salah. Establishing the salah, 
and you go down the list what we call the five pillars of Islam you have also Al Iman Al Islam or the five pillars of Islam have to do with the physical practices of Islam Al Iman on the other hand has to do with the work of the heart believe it in Allah who knows that you do or you don't it's a work of the heart believing in the angels all the belief has to do with the work of the heart now the Prophet وسلم, in this incident with Jibreel السلام, said to the companions that was Jibreel السلام, now in this in this very incident Jibreel came in a form of a human being in a different incident the Prophet وسلم, told the companions I've always recognized Jibreel whenever he comes to me except this very time I didn't know who he was otherwise most times Jibreel alayhi salam course comes in a form of a human being but he was a form of a man known by Dihya al-Kalbi and he was a very handsome Arab person known amongst all the people with handsome looks Allah Ta'ala gave him and most times the Sahaba will be looking at the Prophet وسلم, talking to Dihya al-Kalbi but they wouldn't know whether it is really Dihya al-Kalbi or Jibreel there's no way for him to figure it out unless the Prophet وسلم, tell him about it now one of the things about the angels taking forms of human beings it is sometimes confusing also with the hadith of the Prophet saying that when it comes to a shaytan has the ability to take up shapes and forms that are that come in sometimes in the shape of a mountain so huge and they would also go as small as particles that run in the veins of the blood the angels take shapes and forms but also shayateen do the only difference is when it comes to the angels they're not affected by the shape they take they would take up in other words when the Prophet وسلم, reported the incident of how Allah Ta'ala sent the angel of death to Musa السلام, his time is up and he came to Musa السلام, as he was in his own home and he, told, he tells him your time is up he asked him who are you he says I'm the angel of death the angel of death in this case came to him in the shape of a human being not in the shape of an angel Musa السلام, being the tough character that he was knocks the angel of death so hard that his eye popped out of, out of its socket the angel of death goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to report the incident of Musa saying to Allah oh Allah you sent me to a person who does not like death does not want to die Allah Ta'ala sent the angel of death back to tell Musa السلام, tell Musa to wipe over the back of a Thawr a bull and for each and every single piece of hair that his hand would touch that would grant him a year of a lifespan for him to live again the angel of death goes back to Musa السلام, and reported that to him and he says then what after that imagine if some <coughs> if that chance was given to somebody else he would probably wipe over the whole bowl he wants every single piece of hair to grant him a, a year and he says then what he says then death and he says let it be now let it be now in this very incident 
the relevance of this very incident is the fact that Musa السلام, knocked the shape that the angel of death came into but it did not affect the angel of death meaning that the angels are not affected by the shapes that they take up on the other hand should a shaitan take up a shape and that very shape is hurt so does the shaitan in it that is the difference they do have the ability to take up different shapes and forms but when it comes to the angels they are not affected controlled by that shape they come into on the other hand the jinn does <clears throat> One of, the, one of the articles of Iman is to believe in the angels. And Jibreel السلام, is the most selected, the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who is the trustworthy one about Al-Wahi, revelation, whether that is for the angels in heaven or for the humans throughout time Jibreel السلام, was the one that delivers the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the rest of mankind through their prophets and messengers and the Prophet وسلم, used to love the company of Jibreel السلام. he was the one to teach him if there is anything the Prophet وسلم, would not know, he will go back to Jibreel السلام, to ask the question so he would learn. Example of that is when the group of Jews came to the Prophet وسلم, in Medina and asked him, What is the most beloved place in the eyes of Allah? And also the most hated place in the eyes of Allah. Who could give me that answer? Anybody? What is the most beloved place in the eyes of Allah and the most hated place in the eyes of Allah? Which is it? Ahsan. The most beloved place. He said, I don't know. The Prophet ﷺ initially started by saying, I do not know. A lesson for all of us. Allah Ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ When you initially do not know, don't pretend that you do know, you do know, or feel the pressure that if, if, if you don't show that you do have that knowledge, you're going to be humiliated. It does not make you accept an honorable person when you say, I don't know. First of all, recognizing a problem is half of the solution the other half is to look for the solution and it is solved and this goes for everything so the prophet ﷺ said i don't know let me ask jibreel so he, he goes and asks the prophet jibreel jibreel himself says i don't know let me ask my lord subhanahu wa ta'ala the adab etiquettes from the prophet ﷺ, the same thing from Jibreel alayhi salam. And then comes back with the answer to the Prophet sallallahu This is how we all know that the most beloved place on earth in the eyes of Allah ta'ala is the masajid. These are the houses of Allah. These are the most beloved places to Allah. Allah ta'ala says in regard to that regard, He says, Allah nuru samawati wal ard. Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he is the light of the heavens and the light on earth. The light on earth that people really derive Iman from resides in the houses of Allah, in the masajid. You will not find it anywhere else. That's why the masajid, is, the masjid is the most beloved place in the eyes of Allah. On the other hand, where do you find all types of trickery and cheating and cunning? The marketplaces. That is why the marketplace is most hated place in the eyes of Allah. See? 
And the Prophet وسلم, taught us an etiquette. Every time you walk into the marketplace, first thing you do is say, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al mulku, lahu al hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min kulli sil'atin khasira, aw yameenin kathiba. You make that dua. You can shorten it by saying La ilaha illallah and you go into the marketplace whether that is a Publix, Walmart or a bigger wall, a mall rather. Jibreel alayhi salam taught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so many things. He was also the one to defend the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in so many circumstances. And it is through the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered by Jibreel alayhi salam that we came to know about our obligations towards the hereafter. In this life, we spoke in so many occasions about the obligation of seizing the opportunity of the lifetime Allah Ta'ala granted us in this life because it is through this dunya, linguistically, a dunya, the word dunya, is derived from one or two things. Either ad-dana'a, which is the lowest of the low, if you want to describe something as something has no value, insignificant, it is ad-dunya, linguistically. This is one of the meanings. Also ad-dunya, linguistically, refers to the closest thing to al-akhirah. Because prior to this life called the dunya, we were in the wombs of our mothers. Prior to the wombs of the mothers, we were in the world of a dhar. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدْنَا أَنْ تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ Allah Ta'ala describes as Ibn Abbas says the Prophet or rather the Prophet <coughs> excuse me, says, when Allah Ta'ala created Adam السلام, he wiped over his back and there came all of his offsprings and all, they were all right there before Allah with their souls. And then Allah Ta'ala addressed them, am I not your Lord? We were there. Do we remember any of this? Absolutely not. None of us do. But we do have with us Something that guarantees that very incident had really taken place and we were there. Scholars always refer to two things. One is the incident that happened, happens usually with most of the people to where you will come across someone that if you've never seen before, yet you feel so close to, as if you've known them forever. Or the other hand, or the other way around to where you meet that very person and you feel that distant feeling towards him. You don't want anything to do with that person. How would he explain any of it? That goes back to the original. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-arwahu junoodun mujannada, ma ta'arafa minha atalaf. The English saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. See, people that usually look for their type, for their kind. That's what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. Al-arwah. These are the souls. They recognize the good ones, recognize the good ones, and the bad ones, recognize the bad ones. And the good one and the bad one, whenever they meet, they part ways. They can't get along. See? The Prophet ﷺ reminded us about the importance of the life of a dunya Although it is insignificant in a sense that we're nothing but passing through it yet it is so important for us to focus on making every single moment in it an opportunity to build our abode and residence in the hereafter it is not an easy thing though to do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a hasib an nasu in this world do people think during the life of uh, a dunya do people think 
that they will be left to make the statement of I believe and I am good and self praise as my mother used to always say self praise son is no good self praise it just puts you in the spot of ignorance that you have no idea about what you really are because you are literally you're veiling the truth about what needs to be done no one is perfect but the point people are not going to be left to say I'm good and he sits right there without being tested because the same test that each and every individual goes through was the same test given to those who came before for verily we've tested those who came before them so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know those who were truthful from those who were telling lies lying to whom? to our own selves the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said that when he comes to this marketplace he described it as literally a marketplace this dunya he says everyone wakes up in the morning and walks into the marketplace called a dunya you walk in it in so many ways with your family members with your work with your community with your own inside emotions you are in the marketplace and you are in to be tested because that's what you got in the marketplace somebody's want to sell somebody wants to buy and the Prophet ﷺ says that people will go out into the marketplace and for that day the merchandise though put out on the shelves for trade is your own self and some would sell it for nothing and some they will make a profit how would you sell it for nothing or how would you make a profit it goes back to how much do you know about the path towards Allah and the hereafter the test Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put each and every individual in resides with few enemies one of them is a shaitan a shaitan has one thing in common Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the shaitan alakum aduwum fattakhiduhu aduwa a shaitan is a clear enemy and an enemy by definition linguistically is someone who has the goal of destruction that's it that's linguistically and Allah Ta'ala says لكم مبين, a clear enemy this is the irony of it usually when you don't you don't know your enemy you're puzzled you don't know if it's gonna come out of the window the roof or behind you in front to the side but when you know a shaitan is a clear enemy meaning that the methods of attack are very clear and known yet you fall in those pits that is puzzling but it just goes to show how a shaitan is so persistent and powerful using two things two things one as shahawat second as shubuhat as shahawat are the desires every single individual is equipped created natural disposition with everyone is that it's got craving for the for so many desires some of them are physical the desires of mating and also for food and some of them are emotional like the desire for leadership arrogance and you go down the list those are all tools that shaitan uses to deviate the majority of the sons of Adam 
And if you look at where most problems and most sins are committed through these areas, either through the discipline of finding a mate, so many people fall into so many moral problems in this aspect, or things that have to do with al button, what fills up the stomach, or things that have to do with li'atiqad, the creed, the belief, the discipline for al-shahawat, the desires, sabr. Whenever shaitan comes as a way to attack, the tool to retaliate and counter it is with patience. When it comes to ash-shubuhat, and that is confusions about your own belief, the solution is knowledge. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, Talabu al-ilm, seeking knowledge, at least ala sabil al-najah. You don't need to be a scholar, but at least when it comes to knowledge that will put you in a safe place for your own self in regards to all the things that have to do with the acts of worship, your etiquettes in your house, etiquettes in the marketplace, etiquettes in the masjid, etiquettes in the car, etiquette, very simple things. You have to have at least the basic knowledge in this regard. You don't need to know all the details about a zakah. You don't need to know all the details about al-fara'id. You don't need to, to know all the details about things that have to do with al-asma' wa sifat It is enough for you to know at least the basics. And then leave that to those who are specialized in it, to where if you need it, you pick the phone up and you call that person of knowledge in those details. But when it comes to the basic knowledge, you have to have it with you for whenever you need it, it's, it's ready. The other tool that shaitan uses is a nafs al-ammar bisu, another helper of a shaitan. A nafs al-ammar bisu has one problem. At-tatfif. Can anybody tell me what at-tatfif is? When Allah Ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ Linguistically. At-tatfif. The reason why I'm asking questions so I can have a little bit of uh, attention. <laughs> and some smiles, right. At-tatfif linguistically is for when a person wants something, he wants it to the fullest. Meaning, how much time do I have, Khalid? Jazakumullah khair. I don't, want to burn, I don't want to make it too boring. When a person is asking for his rights, in other words, he wants all of his rights, nothing short than that, all of it. The wife needs to fulfill all of her chores. She needs to do all the chores in the house. How about your chores? No, I don't need to do all of them. That is tatfif. When it comes to you fulfilling your end of the bargain, I can fall short of the mark and it's nobody's business. But when it comes to what I need, I need it to the fullest. That's at tatfif. That's why Allah, and that applies to every single thing. Not necessarily as Allah, it's not exclusive to the verse of al mikyal When it comes to weighing, trading. This is the context in Surah Al-Mutaffifin. Allah Ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ That when it comes to those who go to the marketplace, if something weighs a pound, he wants a pound and a few ounces on top. But when it comes to him paying what it, what it takes, if that item costs seven bucks he wants to pay only five dollars that's why the prophet وسلم, in this regard he says to 
as it was reported by Imam Al-Tirmidhi on, on the authority of Uthman ibn Affan, one time he sold a piece of property to one of the companions and that companion just disappeared, didn't come back. They had a deal, all he had to do just go home and bring the money and the piece of property is his. He never showed up. After a few days, Uthman comes across him and he asks him, how come I've never seen you? I haven't seen you since you, we had a deal and you never, never came back. He said, the minute I left you and I spoke to some of my relatives and the people I knew, they said, you got gypped in this transaction. So I, I really, I, I'm, not, I'm not really happy about it. He says, Wallahi, it's really, it's okay. If you don't want to go through with the deal, it's okay. Do you know why? He says, why? He says, because I heard, I heard. And this is a, a beautiful etiquette, Ikhwan, to have with us. He says, I heard the Prophet Wasallam say, it's not because I feel like it, but because I am holding on to the guidance of Habibi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why. He says, Sami'tu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yaqul, Rahimallahu Abdan, Samhan Ida Ba'a, Samhan Ida Shtara, Samhan Ida Qada, Samhan Ida Qtada. He says, I heard my beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, May Allah Ta'ala have mercy on a person that whenever he is in a transaction, whether that when he buys, he's easy. When he sells, he's easy. When he borrow money, he's easy. When he pay it back, he's easy. Easiness is a key. Apply that to the majority of those who have this tight hand. In other words, At-Tatfif, we're talking about At-Tatfif. And nafs, we go back to the evil self is always, always mutaffifa. This is what it calls people and pushes people to commit tatfif. In what sense? When it comes to what I need, I have it, I need to have it in full. And when it comes to my rights, I can cut corners, no problem. Like what? The Prophet ﷺ never once retaliated when it comes to his person, his person being attacked. You are this and you are that. He never retaliated. Try to find a person from amongst us who whenever someone says even the smallest thing that is negative about him, see what the end result of that is going to be. It will be an all-out war on that person. This is from the evil self. The Prophet ﷺ would walk away. Example, Aisha radiallahu anha was with the Prophet ﷺ and then a group of Jews passed by and they said assalamu alayka ya muhammad and he says wa alaykum they said may death befall you o muhammad and he replied by saying you too that's all he said aisha said wa alaykum assalam wa la'na ya awlad al khanazir he said ya aish she turned back and she said, May Allah curse you, pigs and swines, and she went down. He says, Ya Aish, that's not the character of a believer. See? See? The believer is always lofty. This is only when it comes to his person that who you defending? The bad self. But we don't know that. We think that this, we confuse pride with the bad self. The pride can only be defended when it comes to the deen. The Prophet ﷺ never defended his own character 
unless if he has to do with the religion of Allah, that's when he would get very tough, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas ibn Malik lived with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for 10 years. When the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, made the hijrah to Medina, Anas was a kid. And his mother, <clears throat> Umm Sulaym, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا أُمُّ سُلَيْمِ رَحِمَهَ اللَّهِ She came to the Prophet ﷺ and told him, Ya Rasulullah, هَذَا أُنَيْسْ This is little Anas. This is how she called him. This is a little Anas. And I want him to serve you and learn from you. That's all I want, is for him to learn from you. He said, I served the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years. The whole 10 years with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not once, not once did he ever tell me about something that I did not do right. Why didn't you do it right? Nor did he ever reprimand me about something that I did right. Why did you do it that way? Not once. See? One time, one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ was hard on Anas. And then he came to his def defense. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet ﷺ, when he comes to the bad self, let it get grilled. Let it be humiliated. Because that bad self, for you to know, is an enemy that resides within you eats, drinks, travels, and gets the best, the best seat all the time with you. Yeah, turns around and stab you in the back and keep turning and twisting that sword in there. And is that bad self that you want to come to defend? Absolutely not. So the discipline when it comes to the bad self, never to defend it when it comes to the humiliation. But when it comes to the rights of other, give it back. We got it twisted. We got it backwards. When it comes to the rights of other people, we, we built strategies to where we can literally shortchange anyone at any given moment. Why? Because we're smart. We can get away with it. We're pretty good at getting away with cutting corners this is not only is it wrong and we say it is wrong but in a broader sense but it is a way to give more power to the bad self within when the Prophet ﷺ reports that when he sat with the companions this goes to show that shortchanging people when it comes to giving back giving him back their rights is very destructive. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, can any one of you give me a definition of a bankrupt? They said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, the bankrupt from amongst us is someone who, is, who doesn't have any money. He says, no. The bankrupt is a person who comes in the day of judgment with deeds, good deeds in the size of mountains, which goes to show that the deeds that are right now in our world they are nothing but concept. Has anyone seen Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar? Has any one of us, any of us uh, seen that? It's nothing but a concept. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Kalimatani, two statements. Habibatani ila rahman They're so beloved to Allah. Khafifatan, they're easy on the tongue. But they're very heavy on the scale of the, a person in the Day of Judgment. Meaning that they do have a weight. They will have a shape on the Day of Judgment. Now, the Prophet Wasallam asked him, a bankrupt, the real bankrupt, is a person who will come on the Day of Judgment with good deeds in the size of mountains. Yeah. On the other hand, he will have a long list of people that he cheated this individual. He slapped that one. Backbiting, slandering, cheating, killing, and you go down the list. And he says, people are going to line up 
and then they will get paid from his good deeds that he had in the size of mountains until he runs out but he still have more people to pay back what will happen is when he runs out of the positive he will get more in his red by taken from their bad deeds and tossed on his account he came on the positive end up in in the red in the worst red because it's not like you have a chance to make it right and bring it back up see that's why the Prophet وسلم, when it comes to the bad self again we're talking that the bad self has two ways of having it disciplined never defend it but rather listen it could very well be that the person who is talking ill about you might have something true about what he's saying or she's saying you miss the point of what be, what's being said and you jump directly to defending you thinking that you're defending your honor listen to what it is first and it is best to walk away if it is if someone who is lewd who has loose tongue always talking the best way to deal with that individual is not to reply walk away the best response for somebody who has a big mouth always running 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 the best response response for that individual is you not saying anything let the individual broil if you will in his own bitterness whatever you call it right because that way what do you do you preserve your deeds be stingy be stingy about your deeds you work so hard for them you had to pray that brought you inshallah that had a tremendous reward you want to be a hoarder in that regard hoarder that those good deeds preserve them the sadaqah all the good deeds they come with a price tag you don't want to give it away for free by just letting that tongue loose. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting with the Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and someone walked up to Abu Bakr and he started cursing him up and down. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq looked at the Prophet ﷺ and didn't say anything. The man went on. He got so heated and got comfortable in his streak of insults. And he looked over to the Prophet ﷺ again and kept quiet. And the man went on. The Prophet ﷺ the whole time was smiling as Abu Bakr Siddiq was taking it in. And the man went on. All of a sudden, Abu Bakr Siddiq just let loose. And then he gave it to the man. The Prophet ﷺ stood and walked away. After he finished, he realized that the Prophet ﷺ is not with him anymore. He went after the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? You were sitting by me and you were smiling. All of a sudden you took off. He said, the whole time that that man was cursing you up and down, there was an angel by you replying to him. By you being quiet. The minute you opened your mouth, that angel took off and he was replaced by a shaitan. And me and a shaitan don't sit in the same place. So that's why I left. So you realize that this happens in the world of the unseen, but it is wallahi real. And it is not exclusive to only one individual. It is out there for all of us to enjoy. But we should have the discipline to really bring it about. Because it's not easy. It's easy, they say, to dish it, but it's not easy to take it. But once we get that tongue zipped, when necessary, Wallahi, you're raising yourself to a lofty place. Do not sink down. Keep it up because the bad self want nothing better than to drag you to the lowest place because he has one companion and a buddy of hers and that is a shaitan. That's one, thing, one goal in common. At the end, you will be bankrupt. 
And when the shaytan took an oath with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ في رواية المخلصين قراءة المخلصين المخلصين The difference is كسرة فتحة But a world of difference المخلص is someone الشيطان took an oath with Allah said Oh Allah because of this incident with Adam عليه السلام I swear بعزتك by your might Oh Allah that I will mislead all of his, off his offspring except those المخلصين that you selected and you protected المخلصين with كسرة على اللام are those who selected their own hearts and submitted them to you these two type I can't really mess with المخلصين are the prophets and messengers was salihun. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who follow their footsteps. Al-Mukhlisin are those who work hard to submit their will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and clear that heart and offer it to Allah ta'ala to where whenever there is a do, I hear and I obey. A do not, I hear and I obey. This is in short a Muslim. See? المسلم من سلم الناس من إيش؟ الله أكبر. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says the true Muslim is the one that guarantees other people to be safe from his tongue and his actions. That is a Muslim. والمسلم من سلم الناس إيش؟ بوائقه a true Muslim is someone who is guaranteeing everyone safety from his bad behaviors, actions you're safe, that is why the Prophet وسلم, says that the worst traitor from amongst the people is someone who will give a salam and then goes around and hurt a person because when you say as-salam by definition, as-salamu alaykum, what it means linguistically, you are totally safe from me as an honor, as a property, as a person, all the things about you are safe from my end. Worry none. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi when he says, Assalamu Alaikum to someone, you are entering a contract with that individual. You turn around and you hurt that individual in any way, shape, or form. You're breaking that and breaching that, that contract. Sallallahu Alaihi So a shaitan and the evil self are not the only thing, not the only obstacles. We also have the beauty of this world. This, this dunya called the dunya, it's beautiful. Everything in it is so attractive. The Prophet ﷺ was in the masjid for Salat al-Fajr. And Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah had just brought some money from al-Bahrain. Of course, it came in a time where the population of Medina and the, the Muslim community is extremely poor, very, very poor. This is why one of the wisdoms of the Prophet وسلم, creating the brotherhood between those who came from Mecca and those who are residents of Medina, this is so that they would create that sense of balance economically and socially within the, within the Medina uh, society. But they were extremely poor. So the people heard about the money arriving to Medina and of course that zakat goes of course to 
الفقراء والمساكين and all the eight categories of people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Tawbah so they were all there so they stood in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he came out and he saw them and he said I take it that you heard about the money arriving from Al-Bahrain they said yes ya Rasulullah and we are in a dire need and he says Abshiru good news and glad tidings by Allah مَنْ فَقْرَ أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ By Allah, I am not afraid of you being destroyed by poverty. Why? In a different hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, I asked my Lord three things and he granted me two and kept the third. Did not respond to me about, did not grant me the third. سَأَلْتُ رَبِّي asked my Lord, to not destroy this ummah with flood like what happened with Nuh alayhi salam and he granted me that and I asked my Lord to not destroy my ummah with hunger and he granted me that that's why he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the third one he says I asked my Lord to not cause the destruction of my ummah by the differences between the members of this ummah, white, black, yellow, this nationality and all of them, and he didn't give me that one. That is why you will s you still see those calamities about race, color, and, and, and usually those sentiments and those uh, thoughts, they flourish in a world of ignorance, whether that is with individual or communities. The point, the Prophet ﷺ looked at the companions and he says, by Allah, I am not worried about you being destroyed by hunger. But I can alaykum with dunya. The things I worry about the most for you is a dunya and tuftah alaykum to where the beauty of this world becomes affordable and it is beautiful, attractive. Nobody can resist the attraction of beautiful things. And then you will chase after it and compete over it and you will be destroyed just like what happened to the nations before. They saw it, they got attracted to it, they rushed after it, they competed over it, it destroyed them. That's my worry. <clears throat> the beauty of this world resides with the elements in it. Who can resist a beautiful car? Who can resist a beautiful house? And then you go down the list from small to big things. But there's nothing wrong with you having those things. But not when they become a source of destruction. A source that will keep you away from the things you were created to fulfill. The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it beneficial to get a car beautiful mashallah and you got your dream car and in the process of getting that car you went to the bank and you got yourself in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned as a war if you want to declare war with Allah on yourself go and use a riba usury Go do it. A bank, by definition, is an establishment of usury. Without usury, a bank is bankrupt. It's not there. See? So, in, in short, anything that is beautiful, there's nothing wrong with having it. As long as it, you don't use the wrong means to have it, nor when it becomes a source of destruction meaning it will block your focus on what you're supposed to do and that is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at any given moment any given place at all times the focus that you should not lose is building your abode as salah and I close with this make it to where you start with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now now as we speak, Wallahi ikhwan and sisters, 
I invite you to start from this very moment with a beautiful intention that tonight you will have this very moment at, at a strong and a solid intention to repent to Allah and start a clean slate, a, a, a clear and a fresh page with Allah. Forget about all what happened in the past. Because again, one of those things that a shaitan uses is push the people to either be so comfortable in their skins that I am it and I don't need to do anything. This is amnu makrillah. That those who are so sure that the punishment of Allah Ta'ala is not going to touch them, they're self-deluded. See? And they're gone to the extreme left. On the other hand, you will find those who have gotten to the extreme right by thinking about their sins being the worst on the planet to where they are helpless. Don't be of either. Be a middle course person to where if he goes wrong, you, you are hopeful for the mercy of Allah. And if he goes right, don't be so self-assured. Hold on to it and be thankful and build on that momentum and keep going. Start with fresh and have a plan for you and your family to where start with the discipline of that self with very basic things, small things. Have a program to where you learn something every day. It doesn't have to be too much, but today you learn how to say SubhanAllah. Teach it to your kid. Say SubhanAllah. Is that too much to, to, to teach? It's not, but it's the consistency. The most beloved deeds to Allah are the deeds that are consistent even if they are small even if they're small but the consistency is what pays and you will see all of that and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who when they hear the speech they follow the best of it aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu sallam ala nabiyyina muhammad walhamdulillah rabbil alameen and thank you for having us I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless your community and make you leaders in the da'wah to the deen of al-islam with your actions and your efforts wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh